the um, in scripture, the north, south, east and west are significant. They're very, uh, in fact, important in scripture. The north, south is not our consideration today, but in particular, the north and the south in general, um, uh, reveals in the scriptures reveal, it is the complete political configurations of nations in general. Where things go east west, they don't uh, last very long and uh, or they get undermined, NATO being an example of that. But that, by the way, we're looking at the east and the, to the, and the west, the and to look at the significance of them. And perhaps one of the most obvious things, and I think you referred to it in your prayer, was light and the light of the gospel. And the light um, is, features as coming from the east, frequent references to it in scripture, but nevertheless, it's a daily experience for pretty well everybody on the um, on, on the globe, perhaps those except for those at the extreme ends of the poles, north and south. And so each morning when we get up, the sun rises in the east and the sun shines across towards um, the west. And in the chapter that we um, read uh, together um, a moment ago, we see there um, <clears throat> one or two points I'd just like to draw your attention to. Note the order of the way things are revealed to us, first of all. First of all, in verse um, 7, which we read, that is the verse which tells us that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, formed man of the dust of the ground and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so man was created and given life. And the second point is there in verse eight. It was only then that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, verse eight, um, planted a garden eastward in Eden. We frequently call it the Garden of Eden. Well, it is of Eden, but we need to remember it's not actually the name of the garden. It's a garden that's located in an area or a region known as Eden. A little more on that um, later. And then the third point, we see that um, <clears throat> Eden, um, this area, watered the garden. And it was by a single river going into the garden. Get that in verse um, 10. The river went out of Eden to the garden. And so Eden is the area that is providing this water supply. And it then says, and from thence it parted and became four heads. So it was when it was in the garden that the four heads formed. And we have the names of those um, rivers in verses um, 11 and 12 and 13 and 14, Pison, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Gihon, uh, Hidical and Euphrates. And so significant rivers in scripture um, uh, in as much as they are all named in such a way that it shows that the water is not stagnant or still water, it's flowing water, it's rushing, it's got life in it. It's oxygenated, if you like, and it certainly would be literally. And so waterfalls cause that to uh, oxygen to be um, enter the water courses where there are waterfalls in rivers and so on. But uh, that, by the way, but the, it then tells us that those four rivers um, went out of Eden in particular directions. I think Ethiopia and Assyria uh, and the Gihon, we can identify the directions that those rivers would have gone because we can trace them elsewhere in scripture, but perhaps a little more difficult with Pison. But the fourth point importantly is that it was only 
then when the garden had been established and the Lord created, completed this creative work that he placed man in the garden, verse 15. Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden. So this garden in this area of Eden. And he had a responsibility to look after it, to dress it, to keep it, to use the words of the King James uh, Bible. And then our fifth point from <clears throat> this chapter is to note um, that because Adam was alone, the Lord determined that he would create a woman for him. Uh, and, and he had a wife, Eve. But notice in verse um, 18, Yahweh Elohim said, it's not good for man to dwell, he should be alone. I will make a helpmate, a helpmate for him. And so he was actually, um, she was actually created when he was in the garden. So Eve was created in the garden. Um, Adam was created outside of the garden. They're just little points, but they are, I suggest, worthy of further exp uh, uh, exploration. <clears throat> Hence my point that this is an exploratory talk, because there's a lot of themes that can be picked up here. Now, where was the Garden of Eden? Do we have any scriptures to give us any clues? Well, <clears throat> there is an area um, in the Middle East, and I show it here on this map, a region that is called Eden. And uh, we come to a reference um, to that in a moment or two. And so the region of Eden was where the garden was placed, but it was eastward in Eden. And so this garden where the first um, human pair were uh, living to live, received light from the Lord every day. Um, and so this garden, um, <clears throat> uh, we just um, draw on um, Strong's Concordance for the meaning of the word garden. It's, it's a place that's fenced. So this um, was fenced off. It was clear um, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they would no doubt have seen the fence or the boundaries to it. And it was within those boundaries that the Lord had appointed for them because they had responsibility for dominion to look after it, to tend it, to keep it and so on. And we see that um, a garden occurs 42 references to it in scripture. So what I'm suggesting here in the little um, <clears throat> note at the bottom of the screen now, left, left corner, um, the garden was located in the eastern region of the area known as Eden. And you may have noticed the Euphrates and the Tigris on that um, earlier, um, earlier slide, um, which were in the right area, as it were, from our understanding of what we've read in Genesis 2, for the garden to be in that area. The garden, in fact, had an entrance and it had an exit. And it did actually face east. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse um, 22 and 23. I'm just putting them on the screen. Um, you can look them up by all means. I'll leave them up there for you to make reference should you wish to do so. Um, <clears throat> after the fall, sadly, tragically, the fall of Adam and Eve, there was this division between themselves and Yahweh Elohim in the earlier opening verses of Genesis chapter three, that um, we read here that they were now to become um, such that they would know good and evil. And if they took of the tree of life, then they may live forever. And so there was, it was not permitted for there to be an immortal um, tempter. Therefore, verse 23, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he um, came. And so, verse 24, and so he, that's Yahweh Elohim, drove out the man and he placed him at the east 
of the Garden of Eden. And, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way uh, of the tree of life. So those verses I would um, deduce from them, I think correctly, but stand to be corrected in all this in an exploratory study, that the entrance and the exit to the garden was on the east. They were expelled from the garden and there were the cherubim there with the flaming swords, which um, prevent, uh, uh, pre with the flaming sword rather, um, to keep the way to the tree of life. So they were denied access because of sin. So we're beginning to build up a little bit of a picture of the significance of the East in those opening chapters of Genesis, that um, the garden was in the region of Eden. And as I say, we'll come to another reference to that a little later on. But we just um, pursue the issue a little further of the significance of the East in scripture, because what we do find is that when we come to, to the time of the children of Israel and <clears throat> the seed of Abraham, the 12 tribes, and when the, the children of Israel were in Egypt and that they left that place, you can read this, obviously, you know the verses well, I'm sure, in Exodus, um, the opening chapters of Exodus up to certainly up to um, chapter 12. And when you come to the book of Numbers, what we do find is that the um, that the camp was to be set up in a particular way. And you'll see on this slide the um, tabernacle in the middle, fenced off, uh, same word as for garden. Um, and the Levites, the priesthood, was round the four sides of it. And they were between the people and the place of worship and the place where the Lord dwelt between the cherubim in the most holy place. Lots of lessons and, and symbolism there. But the significance of this, um, it attracts interest, my interest in this study is that when you go to the book of Numbers, those opening chapters, you're able to etch out um, which direction um, everything was placed. Uh, because we have it in that chapter, the, the hatching here, you'll, you'll see it with um, Dan, uh, Judah, Reuben and Ephraim, they were the lead of Th uh, for further three tribes. So there were four on each side, making up the 12. But the sanctuary, but the entrance to um, the tabernacle, and we'll come to another slide in a minute, was in the east. And so to worship God, um, they had to come, they had to bring their offering and come um, from the east to give it to the priest, who would then come from the east into the um, tabernacle area. And we see the sanctuary there with uh, Moses and Aaron uh, on the eastern side, Kohath and Merara, north and south, and Gershom to the um, west. And those ver my verses, my evidence for that is those um, six verses in Numbers chapter two. And so, <clears throat> To look at the layout from um, a bird's eye view, as it were, we see here, bearing in mind that the entrance is on the east side, at the bottom of our screen here, that this is the doorway. And we can pick this up in Revelation as well. Um, the idea of light, of the light coming from the sun's rising, coming from the east. A little further down the line in our consideration. But if, as it were, if we were to walk through this doorway coming from the east, as the priest, as Aaron would, and the priests, they would come across the, um, um, <clears throat> the altar on which they were to make their offerings. And they were to come up a ramp, but notice the position of it. It was um, facing across um, <clears throat> 
to uh, towards the um, <clears throat> uh, uh, where, to the um, let me get my bearings here. It's west and east, north and south. So they would um, be um, coming um, from the uh, east and they would look to their right, as it were, and make their offering. And that had to be that but the altar was positioned, as we've shown there. The washing um, basin, that was um, in the position that it was, but there's no specification or requirement for the direction for it to face. It could be um, could be um, put in any um, any particular um, position um, because the offerers, uh, those who washed, could come from any direction. Sim symbolic language there as well, and so just coming from the east through the doorway into the um, into the enclosure. The entrance to the um, holy, the, the holy place, is through, is from the east through that curtain, uh, the door, and then they go into the uh, where the veil is, and the um, you the the approach from the east continues and ends up ultimately with the well, first of all with the altar of incense, followed by the um, uh, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the um, place where the Lord um, dwelt in the holy place, most holy place, and so um, we just move on a little on this. Ah, if only I'd put those in to start with, that would make life somewhat easier for me. There's the east and the west, so everything had this east-west orientation, and it was of divine appointment. And so we move from that side, we see the altar here of burnt offering, uh, which um, was located by the door, um, the sacrifices in the altar, of course, representing the Lord Jesus Christ. The lava um, was whosoever will let him come. There was no sense of direction, no north, south, east or west from which the um, the, the priest uh, the, uh, from the uh, Aaronic priesthood could come to wash their hands. It was round, so you could come to it from any position. And that's picked up as a spiritual lesson, as I'm sure you know, in Isaiah 55. And so there is a call to whosoever will let him come. And so we see it represents the need for baptism and the access um, to it um, is there for all, um, all who will come and listen. And so the cleansing for us um, from this um, <clears throat> washing of the, of the waters of baptism is symbolized for us. We see exhortation, it's so that we can be clean, se separate and cleansed with the washing, how? By the water of the word. And so um, we <clears throat> move on again. Um, and as I say, this just reminds us of the significance of each of those aspects, but we think of it in terms of East and West. And so the holy place, drawings maybe you've seen before, um, coming from the east um, to serve the Lord. Um, the, th the ways of the Lord um, are in to, for Israel were a requirement to come from the east, as we've already made these points on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, I'll move on. And so the people, we get some clues here as to, if you like, a proof of where Eden actually was. The people of Eden are referred to in scripture as being subjects to Sennacherib in the area of Assyria. And so if you like to um, uh, look this up, um, we see it in um, Two Kings. Um, chapter 19 and verse 2. Remember the 
account of the blasphemy of Rabshakeh. Have the gods of the nations delivered them? This was when he was talking to Hezekiah, who was standing on the walls of Jerusalem in somewhat distress at the surrounding Assyrian force. But Rabshakeh's blasphemy, he says, amongst the things he said, have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan, Haran, Rezef, and the children of Eden, which were in Thessar, in other words, Assyria. And so Eden was a region of um, Assyria in the days of Sennacherib. And so it does put it right, the, um, this area where Eden was, right over near the Persian Gulf, given the proximity of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Now that point is not just there in one place. You find when they spoke to the prophet um, Isaiah, we find the same words uh, in Isaiah 37 um, and verse 12 in the account there of Rabshakeh's blasphemy. Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, goes on Haran, and that, that was up in the north, northern side of um, Israel, way up the um, Euphrates area. And Rezev and the children of Eden, which were in Assyria. Tassar, Tel Assar uh, is a region of Assyria, a, a mound, if you like, an area. And as Strong supports, uh, and this is my evidence for saying this about Talasa. It was a foreign definition of a region of Assyria. So we know where Eden was. And we know the garden was to the east in that region. And so the Assyrian Empire was there, and the children of Eden were subject peoples during that period of time. Also, the Pharaoh's possessions extended to Eden, known as a place for its fertility and beauty. And I won't go to these verses, but if you want to make a note of them to look them up, you'll see there Ezekiel 31 um, verses um, 2 um, and 3 and uh, also verses 8 and 9 and verse 18, all in Ezekiel 31, make reference to the area of Eden, which uh, the Garden of God. Notice it didn't call it the Garden of Eden because it wasn't named. That's quite interesting. I'd like to explore that further myself. Um, it was in the area of Eden the Garden of God. You didn't say it was the Garden of Eden that was there. It's the Garden of God, um, as it was known in ancient times. Uh, we know Tyre traded with the merchants of Eden. Uh, so it was, well, it was a well-known region, uh, which um, was on the landmass for um, Tyre to trade with them, no doubt following the course of the Euphrates down for water sources they went to get to it. And so, and we're told that Eden, was, um, one of the sources uh, of, of gold for the, the, the Tyrian traders was in Eden. Uh, many Prussian stones were mined and processed there. And so we see this area of God's appointment. So those were material matters, but the East was also in scripture presented as a source of wisdom. We know that Job, um, in those opening verses of chapter one, he was from the land of us. He was a man who was perfect or complete. He was upright. He was one that feared God, reverenced God, and he eschewed evil, so sought to remain him uh, separate um, from, from, from evil. And he was the, as verse three tells us, he was a man of means and wealth. And the verse finishes with these words. This man was the greatest of all the men in the East. 
It's interesting also that Cyrus came from the east from the purpose for the purpose of destroying Babylon, God's judgments uh, of divine appointment um, were uh, came frequently from the east. Notice I say the frequent frequently, not always, because we have the king of the north in the latter days and uh, also some other examples. Uh, but he came from the east, Isaiah 41. Who, who, speaking of this man who was raised up, the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him and made him rule over kings. And Cyrus went on a whirlwind tour, um, destroying and subduing nations. And he um, reduced their power and authority to uh, rubble. And... A couple of three chapters later, that one who was raised up from the east, um, because uh, but the Persia was east of um, physically of uh, Syria, Assyria, Babylon. Um, Cyrus is his name, uh, chapter 44. He would fulfill his pressure and bring um, uh, to saying to Jerusalem, and he had this charge to give the Jews the and put them on the starting box to go back and to build the temple. And so the foundation was laid. And the Lord had anointed Cyrus, this one who was raised up from the east, for this purpose, to subdue the nations. And we see their messianic overtones in each of these uh, references. Kings of the north... Uh, King, sorry, King of the North sieges of Israel and her neighbours also happened, which we shouldn't overlook, uh, because there was a, as why I say, the judgments of God on nations didn't come solely from the East, but the light and the truth and the requirement of service to the Lord and the example coming uh, through the example of the Lord Jesus Christ um, did come from the east. But Daniel says of the of the north, this northern invader, he would in he would come into the glorious land. Many countries shall be overthrown, but there will be some that will escape his hand in his thrust into Israel, which we believe to be um, yet to happen, possibly imminent. Um, Edom and Moab. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, shall escape out of his hand and the chief of the children of Ammon. You'll stretch out his hand over the countries and the land of Egypt won't escape. So there'll be this sweep from the north to the south. He shall have power over the treasures and gold and silver of Egypt. We can see his evil intent. Um, the Libyans and the Ethiopians will be with him. And then what do we read? trouble from the east this time. This time there is an intervention that prevents um, him, stops him in his tracks. This invader who's come into the land, tidings out of the east and out of the north will trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make a way. And <clears throat> we do, um, may have views on who is represented, who will bring these tidings from the East. In the generation in which we live, is, does China play a part in troubling the King of the North? Because they're a major economic power and a major military force today. Um, we we um, may not um, <clears throat> uh, see them featured prominently in scripture, uh, but there, there is one other, but um, that's another matter that I could refer to. The tidings out of the east are going to be a serious thorn in the side um, uh, to this power. But he'll establish himself in the land, verse 45, planting his tabernacles between the seas, in other words, between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. Yet he shall come to his end and none will help him. And that would suggest that the power that 
brings him to his end is not the tidings out of the east, but this is another power when he believes he's established in the land. And we believe that to be the work of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes with the saints. And so tidings, just a, an important word in, the, in our Daniel reference, is something that's heard, but it's, it's an announcement. It's just something that's stated and then it takes place, um, not necessarily expected. No, um, Job was a man, the greatest of the men of the East. And we find that wise men came from the East at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. They came uh, from the East and they came to Jerusalem. We've seen his star in the east. So the stimulus for these men in the east was they looked eastward and saw a star and they'd seen his star in the east. And if they'd been looking the other way, they'd be looking to the west. When you think about it, they saw this star and they followed it. Um, uh, you can perhaps imagine them doing it visually as it moved over and over, um, traversed over where they lived in the east. And then they followed it and ended up on the east side of Jerusalem. And so we see that, um, <clears throat> that uh, they pursued uh, their, their, this path and followed it. And when they had heard the king, um, because the king had asked about this, they departed. And lo, the star they saw in the east went before them till it stood over where the young child was. But it's always this star um, which they saw, they recognised this same star in the east moved um, to the place where Jesus was born. And so the east is a significant word in scripture. And so those kings of the east were the Magi, uh, and we've got the Strong's Concordance for it here, oriental scientists by in implication a magician, and a sorcerer, a wise man. And so the wise man, the wise men, seem to have originated in the East, just as the East is the source of the light which the Lord sends day by day. And that comes every day for virtually every nation on the earth. It's, it rises in the East, sets in the West. And so as it comes from the east, it is penetrating darkness because it overcomes darkness at the dawn uh, of each new day. And so we see each day a reminder of a prophecy that will be fulfilled when the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We witness it every day when the sun rises and it's not that the darkness overcomes it the darkness vanishes away as um, the light uh, as, as the uh, sun rises but of course we say the sun rises the sun is stationary it is actually rotating that's another matter but the earth is rotating in um, what we might say looking at uh, our map here um, in a counterclockwise direction. And so during the daytime, with the sun shines on that portion of the earth, that unshaded portion. And as it rotates, every nation receives the sun uh, rising on its eastern horizon. And so the nations look towards the east for their source of natural light. God willing that we pray for the time to come when their source of spiritual light will come and they will look to the east for it. Uh, and as we draw to a close with our considerations, we go to the book of Revelation, Revelation 16. I'm sure you know the words well. Um, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the river Euphrates, symbolic of the... Um, of the Turkish power, the Ottoman world, and the water uh, thereof was dried up, symbolic of the nation. You can go to 
Isaiah um, 8 for a similar link between the Assyria and the, and the river that overflows um, Israel and so on. Um, Israel uh, waters are used in this way of nations and it will dry up. But this drying up is preparing the way for the kings of the east might be prepared. And in our King James Bible, that's how it's expressed. But in a moment, we'll look at one or two other Bibles to see how it is um, expressed um, more fully. And I understand more closely to the um, Greek text. And so the unclean spirits come out um, of the mouth of the dragon, um, <clears throat> as, we, as we read in these verses. And they're working together uh, as devils and, and to bring forth the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the day of great God Almighty. And so the day of Armageddon will be, is drawing near. But that um, verse that the way, the drying up of the Ottoman Empire, um, that um, happened dramatically uh, in 1918 when they, when they were driven out of the Turk was the Ottomans were driven out of the land by uh, the English speaking nations of the world led by um, Britain um, and the river um, and Turkey still is a major power it's the largest NATO largest standing army that NATO has is in in, um, in uh, Turkey um, but that verse, as we see, we look, we see, um, let's go straight to the Young's literal translation at the bottom of the screen for this verse 12. The sixth messenger did pour out his vial upon the great river, the Euphrates, and dried up was its water. And here we have it, that the way of the kings who are from the rising of the sun may be made ready. And so the time is coming, the preparation is, uh, is coming for the Lord to come from the East. Um, and that preparation will include the calling out of the saints for judgment. And it will, by grace, call out those who by grace will be the saints that go with Christ to Jerusalem. And they collectively are the way of the kings of the sun's rising that's going to be made um, ready. And so we um, see in these verses the significance of the East, that it's a place where Christ and the saints will come from. They'll come to Jerusalem and they'll find that the gate of, of Jerusalem, the East Gate, is bricked up at the moment. Solomon II, I think, did that a long time ago. Um, but um, that will not prevent the Lord entering, entering Jerusalem. But the gate um, of the sanctuary, which will face east, um, which looks east, it tells us here. So not only was the tabernacle facing east with its entrance, so was the, so was the garden in Eden, and so will be Ezekiel's temple. It will face the east. And at this time in this prophecy, it was shut, and it will be shut, and it won't be opened. No man will be able to open it. But we find the time when it will be opened, it's for the prince. He shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the way of the same. So the entrance and the exit to the temple are facing east, if we put those um, three verses collectively together. And so the preparation for the kingdom uh, of God is, is uh, will be underway. Materials from the temple for the temple in Jerusalem were prepared in the past, away from the site, as we know. Um, it was assembled as a place for the Lord to be amongst his people. Um, they were 
we are being that, that was under Solomon, but now we are being prepared outside of the temple side, separated from the world. How? By being members of the ecclesia of our Lord Jesus Christ, those that are called out. And so the kingdom of God's to be established by our Lord Jesus. And we know that he will come from the east. Um, we see at the bottom of the screen there some evidence for this. It's Zechariah 14, uh, just those verses four and five, when Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives divides, there's an earthquake, but um, the mountain will cleave um, so that the, um, <clears throat> the Lord will, be able, will come from the east to establish the kingdom of God in Jerusalem. Thank you.